You can turn in your Bibles tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I do want to jump right in. We're going to look at the entire chapter now, which is only 13 verses, but uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, statements that are made in this passage of Scripture that we need to look at closely. So we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The title message tonight is, So What If We Sin? So What If We Sin? And we're switching gears a little bit here in this letter. As I mentioned at the beginning of this study, that um, there's really five problems that, are, that Paul is going to be addressing in this letter to the Corinthians. The first problem had to do with factions or divisions within the church, and that's really chapters 1 through 4. But now we're beginning in chapter 5, and he's now going to deal, deal with another issue there within the church. And so the title message tonight is, So What If We Sin? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. And um, we're going to go ahead and, and begin by reading these first five verses. If you would, please stand in honor of God's Word as we read this together. So Paul's writing, and he says this, It is reported commonly that there is a fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, I have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Let's go in prayer together. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. Lord, as we um, are so thankful, God, as we go through this study verse by verse, God, there's so many passages, God, that we come to that, that Lord, we would never really address if we weren't um, going straight through and, and doing this in, in a, an expository type manner. But Father, the, everything in your word is, is meaningful. It's important for us. And God, I pray that we would be able to to, to see what you uh, have, what you are revealing to us, Father, through this passage of Scripture, not through these 13 verses. And God, I pray that we would um, get a better understanding, God, of grace, a better understanding of, of sin, of judgment, of, of accountability, all these things, God, which are so important that, God, we would uh, have a proper understanding and not have a distorted understanding as we see that it was taking place there in Corinth and, and is, in many ways is taking place in our day, in our community today. But God, we pray your blessing upon this time together now. Give us wisdom and understanding, God. We pray that you would just um, open up your word to us tonight, that we can understand it, and that we can apply it uh, to each one of our lives. But we pray and ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. So as we're reading this passage of Scripture, you think about this question, so what, so what if we sin? So what if we sin? We're saved by grace through faith, right? We're not saved by works. I think we would all affirm that. You know, you, a very common statement today, I, I've heard it my entire life, is that as long as you're saved, that's all that matters. As long as you're saved, that's all that matters. I've probably said that before in my life. You probably, maybe you've said that as well. As long as you're saved, that's all that matters. Now, I want to say this. Your being saved is the, is the most important thing. But the statement, as long as you're saved, that's all that matters, is a false statement. That is not all that matters. Okay? You know, the mentality of we're saved by grace through faith, not saved by works. As long as you're saved, that's all that matters. God still loves me. God's grace is sufficient. So what if we sin? This seems to be the mentality in Corinth that Paul's addressing in this chapter. And it's important that we're reading this tonight because we have the same mentality and belief in, in our culture, East Tennessee. It's all over East Tennessee, all over our community. So what if we sin? I was thinking about um, the lyrics to a country song I can remember from years ago, Confederate Railroad. It's called Jesus and Mama. And uh, as Jana laughs, this is, a, this is a real song. Jesus and Mama, and as I tell you the chorus, you'll probably recognize it. It says, it talks about this guy stealing a car and doing all these things. And he, he go, the chorus goes on to say, Jesus and Mama will always love me, or Jesus and Mama always loved me, even when the devil took control. 
Jesus and Mama always loves me, always loved me, this I know. That's a very good representation of the mentality in our community about sin. Basically what it's saying is, who cares? Sin all you want, your mama will still love you, Jesus will still love you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we're saved by grace. What we see here is that we misapply the truth that our sin, and this is the truth, that our sin is freely forgiven in the death of Christ. That's a truth. That is, that is a reality. I was freely forgiven. I, I didn't do anything. I didn't earn my salvation. I, couldn't, I didn't pay for it. I didn't work for it. Salvation, the, the forgiveness of my sin, my, my sin was freely forgiven in the death of Christ. But we misapply that truth to think, well, then in that case, sin must be no big deal. I mean, if it can be freely forgiven in the death of Christ, then, then it must not be too serious. Forgetting that sin is so serious that it took an infinite payment to pay its debt. It is infinitely serious. It's as serious as the, as the glory of God is serious, as the holiness of God, as the nature of God is serious. That's how serious sin is because it's a violation against that. So because of this, we take sin lightly. They took sin lightly at Corinth, and we take sin lightly today. It's a misapplication of the free gift of God, of the grace of God, to think that sin can be taken lightly. So we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 what Paul is addressing is that a member of the, church, of the church at Corinth has committed incest. So we're talking about incest tonight. Um, you know, as, as I was praying earlier, this is not a scripture we just happened to, this probably maybe isn't like hanging on the wall at your house, like this is one of your favorite scriptures when it says, it is reported commonly that there's a fornication among you. Uh, such fornication is not as much as named amongst the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Is that anyone's favorite verse tonight? Raise your hand. I thought Michael raised his hand. He was putting his arm on the table. I thought, okay, I mean, it's, it's in there. It's God's word. I doubt that's anyone's favorite verse is talking about the, this sin that even the Gentiles would see as, as perverted and deplorable that, that someone would marry their stepmother. A member of the church at Corinth has committed incest and married his stepmother, and the church has supported it. That's what we're talking about. And what Paul is saying when he says that it's not even named amongst the Gentiles, this, this act of fornication, even the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, even the pagans recognize this as fornication. The term fornication just means sexual immorality. It just means that it's sexually immoral. And what it comes down to is you think about God's design for, for human sexuality is that it, it's within a covenant relationship between one man, one woman, a husband and wife. Any, anything that deviates from that is considered sexual immorality. And so the, even the, the, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, they had laws against this. Even the pagans saw this as sexually immoral. But it, you see here that it also it's not just about genetics. It's not just, but, but what, what's happening here is I say that it's his, his stepmother that this man has married. It's not just about genetics when I talk about incest here, but it's about crossing a line and perverting the parent and child relationship, which is ordained by God. Just like it's a violation, you know, within a, a brother and sister relationship, that, that's, what, that's what incest is, is that you're violating that relationship, and that's, that's the seriousness of this. And what Paul is saying is that the Christian church at Corinth has at least tolerated this within the church, if not supported it. When they, what they should have done, as he says in verse 2, is they should have removed him from the congregation. That's what they should have done. But what Paul is saying is, is that since you didn't do what you should have done in the name and in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, I want to come back to that. Since you didn't do what you should have done in the name and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, do it now. Remove this person from among you. And what Paul is, you can tell that there is, you know, that Paul is exasperated by this. He's saying, you know, that, that this isn't even main, named amongst the Gentiles. What, what Paul is, is getting at here with the Corinthians is he's saying, how could you think that God no longer cares about sin? How could you so misunderstand grace to think that God says, well, sin's no big deal, that God no longer cares about sin? How could you misunderstand grace 
and salvation and redemption to that extent. What Paul is saying is that unrepentant sin is serious. What did the Mosaic Law say about this? About a man having his, his father's wife, marrying his father's wife, his stepmother. What did the Mosaic Law say about this? Look at Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11. We're going to have to look at a few different scriptures now to really understand what Paul is saying here. Listen to what this says. Leviticus 20, 11. Under the Mosaic Law, it says, And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely, what does it say? Be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Who cares if we sin? God cares if we sin. Who cares if we sin? You know, what, what Paul is saying is, just because God is, is willing, in, with, with infinite grace, He is willing to forgive sinners, doesn't mean that God has stopped hating sin. God still hates sin. Just because He is infinitely gracious to sinners in forgiving sinners does not mean that God has stopped hating sin. The God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. No question about it. And there's been, again, a misunderstanding even in our own day to try to separate the two to say, well, I don't worship that God of the Old Testament. If you ask me questions about Him, I won't answer them because I don't worship that God. I worship the God of the New Testament. I worship Jesus. The God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. The wages of sin is what? Death. New Testament or Old Testament? Both, really. Romans chapter 3, though. It's where we're quoting that from, that the wages of sin, excuse me, maybe that's Romans chapter 6, that the wages of sin is death. That's in the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira, Old Testament or New Testament? It's the New Testament. What happened in, in I think it was in Acts chapter 5, you know, the message in that is that God, even though God is, is forgiving and loving, He is infinitely gracious, He still hates lying. And it is still in complete contradiction to his nature, which is he is the personification of truth. God hates lying. And we see in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira that God dropped them dead for lying. And we're shocked by that when we read that and say, what an excessive act upon the part of God. The wages of sin is death. The wages of telling a lie is death. That's the message. And that gives us an idea of how much grace we experience every single day. You think about that in the Old Testament, the, one, the man who violated the Sabbath, the, the, the law was given, that, that the Sabbath is, is, you're not to do any work upon the Sabbath, you're, you're to keep it holy. The next day after this is being given, this law is being given, this man is going out and picking up sticks, and, the, and it says that the congregation, that God commanded them to stone that man to death. We reread that and we, we're repulsed by that. We're, we, we're repelled by that and saying, how can God be so severe? Um, you think about Uzzah in the Old Testament when the Ark of the Covenant is being moved and God had commanded and said, do not touch the Ark of the Covenant. It begins to, to be jostled. It, it's going it's it's to fall off the cart. He puts his hand upon it and he dies. You think about Aaron's sons, who God said, there's a certain way that I want you to prepare this incense. They do it their own way. They go before the, the altar there, and fire comes out and consumes them. We read that, and we're completely blown away by that, because what it turns out is that we don't really have a biblical view of God. That's what that exposes, that God really hates sin, and He treats it seriously. And that gives us an idea of how much grace we experience every single day. How many times have I lied and God showed me mercy and God showed me grace? We see one instance where God, in Scripture, where God says, I'm not going to grant grace. I, I'm, I'm going to pass judgment consistent with my nature with Ananias and Sapphira. And we're, we're shocked by that. But that's how much grace I've received. How many times have I told a lie, but God extended His mercy and grace to me and forgave me and showed me that mercy? Who cares if we sin? God. Any more questions? God cares deeply if we sin. You know, as I said earlier, you know, we, we have this mentality, well, that's the Father, well, that's Yahweh in the Old Testament. But now we live under the New Covenant, it's under the Old Covenant, but, but now we're talking about Jesus. 
Notice that Paul says in the name and in the power of our Lord Jesus that he makes this statement here. Why does he say that? What's, he say, what's that based upon? Look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 through 17. It's amazing how, how clear this is and how this really works. And when we deviate from this, how it, it turns into a mess. But, th but Christ is telling us how to deal with conflict, how to deal with disagreements with other people. In Matthew chapter 18, in verse 15, this is how we're to deal. If somebody offends us, sins against us, or so someone has done something wrong, this is how we're to address that. And I've kind of bro broken these three verses up into like three steps. This is what Christ says to do. About trespassing, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So what happens is if somebody, if, if Michael offends me in some way, I don't go tell Jana, but you won't believe what Michael did. If I do that, that's in violation of God's word. Christ says basically we are to be, we're to man up. And that, we have a tendency to be kind of cowardly about that. When somebody does something that I don't like, I'm going to tell everyone but them. Because I don't want to really deal with it. But Christ says, no, you need to deal with it. And if, if Michael's offended you, if Michael's done something against you, you don't tell everybody else, you don't even tell your wife, you go and talk to him about it. And if you can work it out, then you've gained your brother, and there can be a reconciliation there. But if I go and talk to him about it, and he, re he rejects what I say, he, de he says, you know, it's your fault, it's not mine, whatever it might be. Verse 16, but, it, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And so, you know, I'm fallible. And that's where you involve somebody else to say, okay, I want you to, I'm going I'm to pull somebody else in in a discreet way. I'm going to pull someone else, on, on, someone else in on this conflict, on this situation. And I want it kind of a third party um, or, a, or a third and fourth party, one or two more, to come with me. Let's sit down and talk about it together. And maybe as we, as we have this conversation, I might be the one in the wrong. I might be the one that needs to repent. But we sit down together, and, and if they're in agreement to say, Michael has, has done something wrong here, and he says, I'm not listening to you, and I'm not listening to them. Step three. And, and we're to go through these steps. Verse 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them... Tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, so then the church confronts Michael about this, and if he, it, it, if he refuses to hear the church or the assembly of believers, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. He's put out. Okay? There's now a separation there, but it doesn't mean that he can't still repent. He still has that opportunity to repent, but it, now he is treated as an unbeliever because if, if, he is, if he is unwilling to repent of sin, that's given some evidence that there's something wrong in his heart, that he's not really you know, wanting to, to honor Christ in his life, and it can be evidence that he's not really a true convert. He's not really a true Christian. To be treated as a heathen man and a, and a publican, one who is outside the body of Christ, who's outside of the assembly. Christ makes this very clear. We see this three-step process. In this case at Corinth, this is a public sin. The entire church already knows about this, so guess what? There's no going to someone individually now. We're already at step 17, or we're already at verse 17, step 3, because this is a public sin. The entire church at Corinth is well aware of this, so they're already here at step 3, and this is, this is Christ's command. And so I say this again, that who cares if we sin? God cares. Jesus cares if we sin, and he will hold us accountable through his church. Listen to what he says next here in chapter 18, and we'll move on down. He says, Verily or truly I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, Anything that they shall ask, it shall be done unto them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. It, that, that verse is used a lot, and it, I think it's applicable in a lot of situations, but that is in the direct context of really dealing with church discipline. When Christ says that, that where two or three are, are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. And that's why, that's why I word it this way. Jesus cares if we sin, and he will hold us accountable through his church. This is, and that's why Paul says, you do this in the name and in the power of the Lord Jesus as you confront this man about his sin. 
that we are to do this in the name and the power of the Lord Jesus. This is Christ's command, and he will hold his people accountable. He will hold us accountable through his church. I'll, I'll just point this out as well. And we're, we're spending more time on verses 1 through 5. We're going to speed up as we finish the chapter. But I would mention this as well. Look at Revelation chapter 2. Again, dealing with this question of who cares if we sin. You know, Jesus is the friend of sinners. Jesus died for our sin. Surely he'll be okay with these things. You know, surely he won't, there won't be an accountability that Jesus is okay with sin. That's a complete misapplication of the cross and of forgiveness and the grace of God. Listen to what Christ says in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 5, as he addresses the church at Ephesus. He says, Under the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. So this letter is being transcribed from Jesus himself, resurrected at the right hand of the Father. It's being transcribed from Jesus by John to give to the church at Ephesus. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and in, for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. And so he's saying that you are properly judging false teaching, those who claim to be apostles and are not. He's saying that, that he is commending them for that. But then verse 4, he says this, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Listen to what he says next. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. What Christ is saying here is that if a church is unrepentant over sin, essentially Jesus will excommunicate that church. He will break fellowship with that church. That, that, that's how serious Jesus takes sin. He, he is warning the Ephesians because he loves them, he cares for them. He is warning them, saying that if you do not repent of this sin, I'm going to come and basically I'm, I'm going to, to separate myself from you. To take this, um, as he describes it there, I will remove the candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Jesus, although he has died on the cross for our sins, he still hates sin and treats sin seriously. Now what about this being delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, for the saving of the spirit? Well, you see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, Listen to what Paul t tells Timothy that, he is, that he's done here. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may, be, they may learn not to blaspheme. So this is not an isolated situation here at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, but we see that Paul has taken this act, action against Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So what is this being delivered unto Satan? And as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 5, for the destruction of the flesh, for the saving of the spirit. Well, I would say this. It can kind of mean two different things, or it could mean both. But I would, I, would, I would start by saying this. There is strength in numbers spiritually within the church. And deliverance to Satan is the natural consequence of being outside the church. What I'm saying is this. There is, in this world, in the age in which we live, there is no neutral ground anywhere. There is no neutral ground. There is the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of this world. There's nothing in between. It's either the kingdom of God or the kingdom of this world of which Satan is the prince and the power. He is the prince of this world 
It is either His kingdom or it is the kingdom of God. There is no middle ground. There is no neutral ground. As you are put out of the church, it is a natural consequence that you would be going into another dominion outside of the church. And I would say this, that Satan seems particularly ready to pounce on either prideful Christians or pretending Christians. And that's where this comes in about the destruction of the flesh or the saving of the spirit. Which one is it? Well, it could mean that it's a, a person who is truly saved, who is a believer, that they are committing this sin and that their flesh may be, their, their flesh may be destroyed. As we read about over, I think it was in chapter 4, that if we defile the temple of God, that God will destroy that temple. And I think that's referring to our body, which our, holy, our, our body is the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. This may be where there is a, a judgment of, of even to the point of death. Kind of like when, um, as we're going to read later on, some of the Corinthians were taking the Lord's Supper and not really uh, taking it worthily. They weren't examining themselves. And it says that many of those have died and fallen asleep because they, they were taking it, taking it lightly. And so it, this, could be, this could be like Ananias and Zephyra, where I think most likely they were actually true believers that God passes this judgment upon. Their flesh was destroyed, but their spirit was saved. Or this can mean that, that you know, someone who is a false convert, someone who is not really a Christian, who's within the church, living as if they thinking they are a Christian, when you're excommunicated from the church, that should have an effect upon you to say, maybe I'm not really saved. And should wake, it should awaken you to say, and that's where when Christ says, treat this person as a publican or as a, uh, as a heathen, it's to say, you don't completely disregard them, but you get opportunities now. Someone who's been a member of the church, who there's evidence that maybe they weren't truly a believer to the point that they were excommunicated from the church, they're now a candidate for evangelism to say you need to really be saved you claim to be saved you claim to be part of the body of Christ but but the fruit said otherwise you need to truly be saved and so it could be either one of those things or it could be both but I would say this as as a person goes outside of the kingdom of God outside of the church of Christ and into this world it seems that Satan, who is the prince of this world, seems particularly ready to pounce on pretending Christians or prideful Christians. I think about Cain comes to mind, who, who, who God spoke to him and said that, that if you do what is right, it will be accepted. But if not, what does he say next? It's a kind of a strange statement. He says that sin croucheth at the door. It's like it's waiting for you to be disobedient, for you to do what is wrong, to, to pounce upon you, and for this to become even worse than it, than it was. So Cain comes to mind, Judas comes to mind, who, who, who claimed to follow Christ, claimed to be an apostle of Christ, but, came, but come to find out that he, he was a, a false apostle, the son of perdition, and, and Satan basically destroyed him, used him, and then destroyed him. It also comes to mind about the hedge that's upon Job. All these different Old Testament references come to mind about this hedge that's, upon, that's around Job that has to be lifted in order for Satan to, to be able to affect Job. And so all these things come to mind as I think about someone being delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, for the saving of the spirit. And we can talk about that more in our discussion groups. But I think that's what's being referred to here when Paul makes that statement. But we come back to this question of, so what if we sin? So what if we sin? Well, I would say this, and this is, this is for the church at Corinth, and it's for us. So what if we sin? If you sin, it affects you. But it doesn't just affect you, it affects your family. And it doesn't just affect you and your family, but it also affects your church. It affects others beyond you. It affects them, and in some ways it infects them. Because sin has a tendency to spread. You know, you can't compartmentalize sin in your life. In your mind, you might say something like, well, it doesn't matter what I do after everybody else goes to bed. You know, this is just something that I do that it's kind of compartmentalized. That's a part of my life, but it's not going to affect the rest of my life. That's impossible. Sin does not work that way. Sin spreads in our life. You can't have some part of your life that, where there's unrepentant sin that's not going to affect every other aspect of your life. So it spreads throughout your own life, but then it also spreads throughout your family. 
then it also spreads throughout your church. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, so we can continue on from what Paul's writing here in chapter 5. He's telling the Corinthians, he says, your glorying is not good. So they're, I mean, they're not, this is, doesn't concern them at all. This man has is, is committed this sin and is living in this sin, unrepentant. He's saying that, that you're, you're glorying in this, you're, you're tolerating it, if not, um, if, if not accepting it and supporting it. He says, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, he's talking about yeast, leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So he's looking at this imagery of the Old Testament, the Passover that they were to eat that night of the Passover, they were to eat unleavened bread. Because yeast or leaven kind of has the picture of sin. He goes on in verse, verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul is using this imagery of leaven or yeast as a picture of sin as, as it is in the Old Testament. And what he's saying is, is that if you take a lump of dough and you sprinkle yeast on it, once you begin to fold that dough over and you work it in, you'll never get it out. It permeates every, it has now gone from an unleavened uh, lump of dough or unleavened bread to leavened bread. You could never extract that yeast from that lump of dough once it is worked in. That's the picture that, that Paul is drawing upon here. So he's saying that once it gets in, you will never get it out. It spreads and it permeates the dough. You have to purge it out immediately. So if you imagine this imagery, I have this huge lump of dough and I begin to sprinkle some, some yeast on it. The only way to address that is to cut that, to pull that dough to, and that, that has that yeast touching it, to remove that immediately or it will end up permeating that entire lump of dough. That's the imagery that Paul is pointing to here about sin. Is he saying that it, it will not stay in one place. It spreads. It, it's like an infection. It spreads and it permeates. And when we play around with sin, it's amazing how it always is going to, going to go further than what we ever intended it to go. And I've seen that in my own life, my own personal experience, and I'm sure you have as well. But finally, as we finish tonight, Paul clarifies a very important distinction in verses 9 through 13. He says this. He says, it says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to accompany the fornicator. So he's, a, he's talking about a letter that he'd written previously. And so we, we can talk more about that at a later time, but it's not something that, that, that has been retained for the good of the church today the way that First and Second Corinthians have. But there was an earlier letter that was written in which Paul said, do not keep company with fornicators. Verse 10, he's going to clarify this. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, the sexually immoral of this world, or with covetous, that's somebody who always wants more, who's greedy, or extortioners. That's someone who is, um, who is going to steal through violence, almost like a, someone who strong arms somebody. Think about like a mobster or something, or, or an armed robber. So, yet not altogether with fornicators or sexually immoral of the world, or with covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, those who worship idols. For then you must needs go out of the world. He's saying if you're, if I was talking about the world, when I said don't keep company with fornicators, you couldn't go out into society. But he goes on in verse 11, it says, But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a, or a railer, that's somebody who's slanderous or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. Do not associate with them. For what have I to do to judge them that are without, those who are without the church? He's saying, I'm not, I'm not telling you to judge the deeds of the world around you. He's saying, do, you, do not you judge them that are within. You're judging those that are within the church. The accountability is here, not out there. For them that are without God, excuse me, for those, them that are without, those who are outside the church, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The man he's referred to in verses 1 and 2. What Paul is saying here is this. Do not expect lost people to act like Christians. I think we are guilty of that at times. I'm guilty of that. Do not expect lost people to act like Christians. Expect lost people to act like lost people. But expect Christians to act like Christians. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about a life of sinless perfection. I'm talking about consistency. This, we're not talking tonight, I want to make sure this is clear. 
when I say that, so what if we sin? I'm not talking about failing and sinning and then repenting of that sin. I'm talking about giving your life over to sin. When you are living in a sin, when you say, I'm committing this sin today, and I'm going to commit it again tomorrow and next week, and this is what I'm going to do, and you can't judge me about it. It's between me and God. That's what's being addressed here. That is living inconsistently. That is, that is unrepentant sin. That is giving your life over to sin while professing to be a follower of Christ. As I said earlier, part of the strength, uh, part of the strength in numbers is holding each other accountable. As we conclude tonight, so what if we sin? This is what it comes down to. If I live, if I, Jordan, if I personally, if I live a holy, pure, Christ-centered life, and Jana lives a pure, holy, Christ-centered life, and Brady lives a pure, holy, Christ-centered life, and Julie lives a pure and holy, Christ-centered life, then we become a pure, a holy and pure Christ-centered church. That's where pure and holy Christ-centered churches come from. It's a collection of individuals who are holy and pure and Christ-centered. They don't come from anywhere else. It's a collection of individuals who are Christ-centered. But if I decide to be self-centered this week... If I'm burnt out and I say, I've had enough, I, I've had enough of, of caring about Christ, centered on Christ, caring about everybody else, I'm going to care about Jordan this week. If I go back to my old ways of being self-centered this week, suddenly we're not as Christ-centered as we were last week. I've diminished the whole group. That's how churches crumble. And their witness is lost. Our repentance and our faithfulness, my repentance, my faithfulness, my Christ-centeredness matters to this church. Not just to me, not just to my wife, not just to my family. It matters to this church. That's the point that Paul is making here. So what if we see it? It destroys the church. That's so what. What's the consequence? Where's the victim? The church will be destroyed. When we sin and we are not repentant in our sin, it destroys the church. It destroys the witness of the church. That's what Paul is addressing here. Our holiness, our purity, our Christ-centeredness is so important for me personally, for my family, and for this church. And you cannot separate those, you cannot separate those from one another. But we're going to stop with that tonight and look at our questions together and split up into our groups.